Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around for this talk. Uh, indeed, I'm Ashley Montanaro. I'm co-founder and CEO of Facecraft, the quantum algorithms company. Um, so today I want to be talking about quantum computing. Now, many of you have probably heard a bit about quantum computing, how quantum computers could enable us to solve problems such as designing new materials for maybe batteries or solar cells. They can solve incredibly challenging problems in the blink of an eye that even the world's best supercomputers can't address. And they may even help us attack climate change. But many of you have probably also heard about some of the challenges faced by quantum computing. So today's quantum computers are still pretty small. They are affected by errors and unwanted interactions with the environment. And if you want to implement quantum fault tolerance to deal with these errors, this can come with overheads of maybe factors of thousands or even millions of qubits um, to enable the computation to proceed uh, very accurately. Um, so this is why, the, even though in many ways it feels like we're all living in the future, for me, sometimes it feels a bit like we're living in the 1950s. Because this is the way the world was in the 1950s as well. Like at that time, uh, people were also developing incredibly exciting new technology that was pushing at the boundaries of what was thought possible with the laws of physics. Now, this picture isn't showing a quantum computer. It's actually showing the memory unit for the UNIVAC. This was uh, one of the first stored program electronic computers. And it was actually used to predict the results of a US presidential election. So the, um, the uh, engineers and scientists who developed this machine actually didn't uh, believe the results at first when it predicted that there was going to be a landslide victory for, for Eisenhower. And they hadn't even programmed in the third digit at, uh, in the chances at the bottom. So that's why it says zero to one rather than 100 to one. But this was an early example of the incredible power of this uh, new technology. But, and one thing I think that's often forgotten uh, from this sort of era is that these breakthrough developments in computer hardware would not have achieved their true potential were it not for the algorithms and software that was developed alongside that hardware. So just to show you a couple of examples of this, going back a little bit further, this is the ENIAC, another very important early computing device. And this was used to model the dynamics of nuclear reactions. But this would not have been possible without the development of the Monte Carlo method by John von Neumann, Nicholas Metropolis, uh, and others. And this is a method that's actually dear to my heart because many years later, I actually developed a quantum algorithm for accelerating this, uh, this approach. And if we go back even further, like uh, th during the, uh, the Second World War, the uh, machine that was built to crack the Enigma code was only usable because of the mathematical techniques that Alan Turing developed to um, accurately crack codes with the minimum possible use of that computing hardware. So if we go back to today, the imperative we believe is clear. We should put as much effort into developing the algorithms as we are into developing the hardware on which the algorithms will run. And that's exactly what we're doing at Facecraft. We are uh, working on the algorithms and the software that quantum computers will need in order to solve genuinely important problems now or in the next few years, rather than 10, 20, or 30 years from now, in collaboration with the world's best quantum hardware manufacturers. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to tell you a little bit about some of the problems we're, we're addressing and how we go about this. So this uh, picture is now showing a, a particular materials system called strontium vanadate, which is a potential component for next generation battery cathode materials. Now, this is a uh, material system which is notoriously challenging for standard classical computing to model. And in fact, the standard method for doing this, density functional theory, completely breaks down when it tries to do so. However, if you look at the complexity of the best quantum algorithm for solving this modeling problem, for modeling strontium vanadate, um, at the time that Phasecraft was founded, this algorithm would have required 11 trillion operations to run, which is far beyond the capabilities of even today's best quantum computing hardware. So based on what was known at about this time, about a bit more than five years ago, it seemed that modeling strontium vanadate was intractable for either classical or quantum computers. So, what we did at Phasecraft, or one of the things that we did, is we started attacking this problem by developing a full materials modeling stack 
that goes all of the way from the description of a material right the way through to a quantum algorithm and, and quantum circuit for modeling that material. And this incorporates a number of different ingredients. So firstly, uh, we picked the key aspects of the problem that we were solving and, and, and used the quantum algorithm to just model those rather than the entire system. So we threw away the parts which were sort of less interesting or less important for real applications. Then the next step is to understand how to encode this problem uh, uh, in a straightforward and uh, efficient way on the quantum computer. And to do this, we incorporated knowledge from material science and condensed matter physics to encode this electronic system in terms of the qubits which are on the quantum computer itself. Then to actually implement the simulation of this uh, system, we developed an efficient algorithm for modeling its uh, dynamics and preparing sort of low energy states via a, a computational approach that involved the development of a compiler effectively for develop making the algorithm efficient. And ultimately, we also developed a protocol for optimizing the measurements that we might want to perform on this material to determine its properties. And by bringing together all of these different ingredients, we were able to significantly reduce the cost of this materials modeling problem. So if we look at uh, the complexity of this problem over time, as I mentioned, like, at the point before Phasecraft was founded, you would have needed about 11 trillion operations to, to model this. But uh, after Phasecraft was, uh, after our materials modeling uh, toolkit was brought to bear on this problem, we managed to reduce the complexity to within touching distance of today's best quantum computers. So here the y-axis is showing the number of quantum operations that an algorithm needs and the number of operations that hardware can perform over time. Um, and you can also see that actually this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. So this is showing that we have this uh, sort of Moore's law development in the uh, capabilities of the quantum hardware, which is really encouraging for the future of quantum computing. So bringing together all these ingredients, we managed to reduce the cost of modeling this material system by around 43 million times. Um, and it was not just a one-off. In fact, this approach can be applied across many other different material systems. And if you go to our website, materials.facecraft.io, you'll see more than 40 of these where we've been able to successfully apply um, our ideas. So this was very exciting for us. But actually, this isn't quite enough because we don't want to be just within touching distance of the capabilities of today's quantum hardware. We want to be actually within the capabilities of today's quantum hardware. So to achieve this, we took a step back and took a page out of the book from the uh, standard method of modeling materials on a standard classical computer, which is called density functional theory, or, or DFT. So this is an amazing idea, which was responsible for, I think, two Nobel Prizes. And it's become the workhorse method for computational modeling in chemistry. And in fact, it works really pretty well. The only thing that it can't deal with is quantum correlations in the physical systems that it's uh, addressing. And that's just one part of this overall tool chain. And so we had the idea, what if we can replace this part with a quantum algorithm and use the quantum computer only for modeling the quantum correlations in physical systems? And we, we uh, implemented this in what we're calling quantum enhanced density functional theory. And I just want to say a little bit about how well this performed. So what this plot here is showing is the um, low energy properties of a particular physical system called the Fermi Hubbard model in 1D, which is a notoriously challenging system to model and may form a, um, a, a framework for understanding high temperature superconductors. And what we should see in this plot are these um, sort of flat uh, shoulders here. Then, and this is indicative of a mix of insulating and uh, um, conducting behavior in this physical system. But standard classical D DFT, this gray curve here, gets this completely wrong, and it does not pick up this physical feature. You can only get it classically by going to a fine-tuned version of DFT, which cheats by actually knowing the exact solution to this particular problem before it starts. Quantum enhanced DFT is able to pick up this physical feature, the, these shoulders, um, without cheating by knowing the exact solution. And it extends to 2D and 3D systems where we don't know the solution in advance. So this is why we're really excited about this as a technique for materials modeling going forward. Okay. So 
But it's not just enough to develop algorithms in isolation. You actually need to run them on real hardware to ultimately do something useful with those algorithms. So we're doing this as well. In collaboration with our partners at Google, we were able to run a quantum algorithm for doing a simulation of a materials model using their world-leading quantum hardware and bringing to bear some new error mitigation technology and ultra-efficient algorithms we developed we were able to run an algorithm that used 10 times more operations than the best previous algorithm and also used, uh, solved a system that was four times bigger than anyone had done previously. So it's this combination of developing the algorithms and working closely with the hardware which enables us to get these um, breakthroughs. And these sort of results are not just useful now. They're going to um, also be strongly applicable as the quantum hardware gets better and better because as the hardware gets better, more and more efficient algorithms will enable us to get more and more out of that quantum hardware. And what does this mean? So this isn't just a sort of scientific curiosity. What this means is things like discovering novel battery materials using quantum computers years earlier than we might be able to do otherwise. It means bringing new drugs to clinical trials um, years earlier than without quantum technology. And even beyond modeling quantum systems themselves, it enables things like solving hard optimization problems that enable us to produce a more efficient energy network and lower everyone's electricity bills. So this is why we're working with the world's best quantum hardware manufacturers um, in order to get to these goals. And the reason why they're working with us is that they believe that it's our algorithms and software that are going to help them to get there and get the most out of their hardware. And together, we believe that um, really it's going to be the quantum algorithms that are going to unlock quantum advantage with quantum computing technology. So that's everything I wanted to say. So thank you all very, very much. Thanks.